pinnacle of his power, a man risks losing control. The world is not kind, so its king has become cruel. Murder is never mercy, it's never noble, and it's never redeemable. To the maniac, murder is an art form. Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. I am joined today, as always, by my co-host, Sam. Happy early 4th of July and a happy belated Canada Day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm also joined tonight by uh, Lisa Langlois, who you know from her performances in Phobia, Happy Birthday to Me, Class of 1984, Deadly Eyes, The Joy of Sex, The Nest, and Transformations as well as some classic television work on some genre-related shows like Forever Night and PSI. How are you doing tonight, Lisa, besides not watching hockey? Uh, I, I'm doing great, actually. It's, it's always fun to get together with people who have uh, uh, an, an appreciation for horror. Very much. Well, then you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just start by just kind of giving you the background of how I fell into knowing you, which is a really roundabout way. Uh, I grew up at a time when there wasn't VCRs in the house. Um, that was that was about midway through my adolescence that a VCR came to the house. And television was three networks and two UHF stations, as well as PBS, so that didn't count because I didn't want to watch anything that was on that, except maybe that making of Star Wars special that came on during the telethon that I turned off halfway because it was never really that good, but I thought it was. But I was big on buying any book that, that was at a yard sale or at a library sale that had anything to do with the horror genre, especially horror movies. And a novelization of Phobia was one of those books that got picked up. And I probably read that 212-page or so novelization, barely written by today's standards. It's, it's the screenplay, just with full sentences. I probably read it five or six times and I had the whole movie played out in my head. And that's not how I found you. I found you because eventually I saw Happy Birthday to Me on VHS. And Phobia remained very much elusive for a long time for me. It was well into the 1990s when before I found the movie. And that was the point where I started to realize, hey, that's that girl that's also in and in and in and and I suddenly realized you're genre royalty, and yet, yeah, how can I say this? We don't talk enough about the people who actually form the backbone of these films. We tend to talk about some Marquet directors or some people who wrote some great music for films, but like the actors, and it seems like a, a relatively small class of actors form the backbone of an entire industry for a time. This this is this this is actually true. It's a very good point that you're making, and I, and um, I just wonder, you know, and it's probably one of the reasons I did move to the states. There 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 were three reasons, but one of them being that at, at the time during the tax shelter terror uh, era, um, I wondered whether I was getting cast for me or whether that I was just a point. So because you are a point though, you're gonna end up with the same actors over and over in like just different incarnations. So you, you, you'll you see Laurie Halyard and Lenore Zen and Leslie Donaldson in, in, in these, these Canadian movies, these tech shelter horror movies. So let's back up a second. Uh, before you start getting offered these roles in the genre. What was your connection with the genre? Did you grow up watching horror films or was it a late blooming thing? No, or no, it I, still always, not I, always, I always loved 
horror movies. I, you know, my, my earliest memory was is maybe when I was like five years old, and I've always wondered what that movie was. Um, I was at my cousin's, and there, this woman would turn into a vampire at night, and we were watching it um, in in the basement. And then, you know, of course, then you move on to being a teenager, and I just like love going to the dust to dawn. Uh, drive-in movies with, you know, on long weekends, or all the horror movies. And then um, I just I, really, I, I kind of fell into it because that's what was being made at the time. You know, once, once um, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis did Terror Train, then everything took off. And so it's how many movies can we make with, 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 with young, you know, teenage adults? In, in the horror genre, and I happen to be in in that age group. Was it something you just kind of fell into when you were getting those roles, or were you actively like aiming for them in the horror genre? No, I wasn't at, aiming for them. Actually, you know, in Canada, what, that's one of the reasons I moved away too to the United States is that the the industry at the time wasn't what it is now with the boom, and the, the work was very seasonal. It was only really in the summertime, and I, I remember the moment I had to, to to move because there was one film shooting in January in the whole country, and I was cast in it, so it was very complimentary, and it was called The Rats, which is Deadly Eyes. It too based on a novel, and uh, Robert Klaus is the director, and a great director. That you know, I, I have this list of great directors I've gotten a chance to 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 work with, and it just turned out that's what they were. In fact, I was afraid of doing all these movies because, you know, I'd started out working with Paul Chabrol, and I did like you know, Blood Relatives, and, and I did Violet Nozier uh, opposite um, Isabelle Huppert. So, you know, I, I was more of an artiste, you know, and but that's what was available. And in Canada, they don't have unemployment insurance for actors, and they also you don't get residuals, so. You, you know, you you take what, what what's what's there essentially, and it just happened to be that that's what was being made. Huh. Kind of like what's being made now. A lot of these Hallmark movies in Canada. Yeah. 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 I have to say, like, I'm sorry, Lauren. Can I just get this in? I'm gonna forget. But I, you know, watching Class <laughs> of 1984, I could not help but I was like thinking, wow, Patsy's kind of like the blueprint for our modern day version of Harley Quinn. So that's I, a great comparison. It just, yes. it really struck me like she's very evil and sprite-like and just bouncing all over the place. And I was like, wait, is this where we got Harley, the new, like the more recent versions of Harley Quinn from? That's, that, you know what I mean? I have know, I've seen that, I've seen that comparison where um, Patsy's compared to, compared to Harley Quinn, like being, you know, as Stegman's, you know, I Stegman's. never, I haven't seen that, but I'm going to, did you see that on social media or something? Because that's a very good comparison, but I haven't seen, you're the yeah. first person I've heard it from. Oh no, I found it somewhere on the internet. You know, I was, because I was completely, you know, new to class of 1984 and I'd heard about happy birthday to me, but I'd never had a chance to see that one. But yeah, I mean, class of 1984 is pretty intense. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. Like that's a hard movie to watch. It, it, it is. And at, at the time though, I remember thinking, oh, this is so far fetched that, you know, we're going to go through metal detectors to get into classes, to get into school. <laughs> and we were there a long time ago. And I understand, though, too, you know, this is an American director so it, it from Los Angeles. So, you know, he has kind of an, you know, an inkling towards it more than we would have been seeing it in, in, in Toronto at, at the time. But um, I, I remember, too, that on, on class of 1984, um, Nobody, punks weren't wearing color in their hair, so it was very avant-garde, really, for this these hairdressers to, to yeah. have given me pink and purple uh, hair. But at the same time, what happened to me is they hired real uh, punk people to be extras. Wow. And uh, these women were non-plus that I looked the way I did and <laughs> that I was dressed the way I did and I had hair color, and they were threatening me. So you will see if you watch the film closely, and I was hoping that nobody, the director, nobody, and they didn't. I I I made myself very scarce in all the um, slam dancing scenes, like the club scenes, because they literally said to me, "We're going to get you, these girls." Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I made sure that there was never an occasion that they I was by myself, or that I was in a situation where they could say, "Oops, sorry, we hurt you during this scene." Yeah. 
Yeah, I imagine slam dancing is no joke. I had a friend that broke his wrist in a mosh pit, so I, I, I feel like it's <laughs> probably fairly similar. Lauren, you would know more about that than I would, probably. I, I have a scar over my right eye from uh, Skinhead's boot from a... You did? Pit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, it was bad. That was a bad night. That was an agnostic front show back in the day. Wow. But, uh, I, you know, it's funny. I was going to get to this eventually, but we'll do it now. Um, with talk about 80, class of 84... Isn't it interesting how the dystopian films of the 70s and 80s were all about the, the countercultures taking over or getting a foothold in the society, but the dystopian films now are all about totalitarian regimes? It's, right. it, it's, it's shifted at some point. And I think it's, it, I always say this about the horror genre, it's the one genre that can speak large and it can get truths out there because it, exaggeration is just baked in to the cake, right? Right. I don't think there's another genre that could have kind of mapped that change in our society, that view that it used to be we were worried about the bikers and the hippies like Omega Man, right? And, or then a little bit later, the punk rockers, as you see in Mad Max and Class of 84. But then today, every single young adult adaptation is an oppressive government without fail. And the outcasts, the punks, as it were, are the heroes. Right. Right. Well, it's interesting because some of the fans, they they write me and, and it's I never saw these characters as heroes, but the fans that write me were their heroes. Well, I, th I think that there's again, I think if you're looking back, especially if you're younger than myself, <laughs> um, it, you're looking back it's really hard to see the authority figures as the good guys because you're just conditioned. That's where we're at now is that the idea of kind of people who are going to tell you what to do or think are probably the villains. Oh, Whereas yeah. in an earlier yeah, age. Corey King was so non-villain. How could you? I know. You know he, did to you. he was so, just so nice. And he actually is really nice in person. In fact, yeah, yeah. I read the, 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 the show I went to um, that we, I was talking about earlier with Eileen Deason, Perry King was there. And I was telling him that, you know, I get all these requests to, for class of 94 to go to these. He goes, oh, I, 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 can't, I can't promote that. I, I don't feel good about it. I said, P Perry, I said, you got to. I said, the, they, they're fans and, and they're, they're just so happy and we're inspiring for them. And so he's, he was more open to it. But at first he was saying, I, I, I can't, I know I can't do it. Yeah. He gives sure. a wonderful performance in class of 84. And the thing is, he looks just like my old roommate who now brews kombucha. <laughs> he was a key. So it was like, it was really easy for me to like him. Right, right. No, he was so good and so likable. I, you know, I never saw the sequel, Class of 1999. Did you guys see it? Oh, I, I did saw, not know there was one. I, I saw it and I also saw the sequel to Class of 1999 called Class of 1999 Part 2, which is a bizarre title considering it's the third part of a franchise. And, and is it all Mark Lester? The third isn't, I don't think. I think just the second one is. Um, but it's a completely different film. It's it's a, it's hard sci-fi. There is there is Android oh. teachers attacking students in that film. So I literally just Googled it, and the first thing I see is, like, this mutant dude pop up. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. And the, and the third one's really cheap. Like, really cheap. Like, what you're thinking? No, no, no. Re go, go cheaper. Um, really? And and what is, what is Class of, of 1999 about? It's about a program the government has to try and pa pacify the um, violence in schools by putting robotic like teachers in the school, cy cy cybernetic teachers, I guess. But then they all start going haywire and just killing kids indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. Again, thought, that's, that's a good example of like that change. <laughs> right. I, I, what, what I thought in class of 1984, what was brilliant, it was to get, um, oh my God, I've forgotten his name. Lassie, what's his name? The actor, oh my God, I just forgot his name. Brilliant British actor. Class of 1999? No, in 1994. Um, oh, Rod Roddy McDowell? Yeah, I thought that was brilliant to get him. And I think that the only person they're missing is to, they should have had Glenn Ford from Blackboard Jungle in there. That would have been great. Oh, that would have been cool. Yeah. That would have been really wild. And I, I don't know whether he was still alive. I don't know where they hadn't thought of him, but um, that was like what, you know, there, there, there are some times you look over in your career and where there's, you're truly afraid because you think, wow, this, this actor can blow me off the screen because they're so good. That was one of them when I had to do that 
uh, scene with Roddy McDowell where he has the gun to my head because I just thought this guy, he, he can, he, he's, can really emote. And then opposite, um, when I, I did Minefield opposite to Christopher Plummer, like, you know, there's, there's some times where somebody comes along and you just think, okay, I, I hope I can hold my own here. Yeah, I probably would have been Roddy McDowell if I had ever gone into teaching. That would just be me in class of '84. <laughs> I'd be like, I'd be like drunk all the time, be shooting, be threatening to shoot my students if they answered a question wrong, and then I'd flip my car trying to run one over. What well, you know, no they were doing that. I mean, it, it, I mean, was this last year, the year before, that a, a, a teacher brought a gun to school? I can't remember what that was. Oh, and speaking of like running the the, the 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 kids over, I mean, when I was running in that scene. That wasn't acting. That was truly running because they did not have a stunt driver. Oh my God. Roddy McDowell was like chasing after us. Oh so my God. That, 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 was, that was not acting. That was, that was for real. I was truly afraid. Oh my God. That is wild. See, yeah, like, yeah, it was all about, that was one of the frustrations of living here too. It, it was like really the wild, wild west and there, there, everybody was just doing what they wanted to do. And you know, so many times you, you were in danger. You're just, you're really in danger. So I, I'm totally going to have to go back and rewatch class of 84 again now. Yeah. Watch. Now I'm going to be like, Oh, all this behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. And it is screaming on shutter. Oh, right yeah, now. Yeah, and, then, and then, and then, um, the, the other thing is, um, the stunt coordinator, uh, was the guy who did Indiana Jones, Terry Leonard. And, uh, I was, you know, one of the things that was really hard for me in that role is they gave me nothing to do. They gave me nothing to say. They gave me no, no, no directions, nothing. So everything was improv for me, everything that I did, but it was very frustrating because they never put me any fight scenes ever. They never, then the only time I was really happy that I wasn't in a fight mm -hmm. scene is when they have that rumble and it's under the, you know, uh, the, the, the highway. And it was so cold out that day, oh. rainy and cold. And I was just so glad not to have to be out in the cold winter of Canada in when it's wet doing this fight scene. And I just stayed in a trailer, you know, reading, you know, Shelley Winter's biography. <laughs> I, <laughs> but, um, I'll, the, here's the other thing about the Wild Wild West. So there was this guy that he played Tim Van Patten's double, right? For falling through that glass at the end. That was crazy. That it, is it, crazy. It, was, it was really, really crazy. But what's even crazier is he had been briefly, he was like a beginner actor and he was, he, he was in my acting class. He was assigned as my partner up in Toronto. So that's fine. And he said he was going to get into stunt work. And it was his first time. And he got the the part, basically, because he resembled, you know, Tim Van Pat in his body. So the next film I did right after that was The Rats or Deadly Eyes. And so I get on that film. And I go, oh, how, how are you doing? What are you doing here? And he said, I'm the stunt coordinator. And it, and it was terrifying. I just thought, he was was no experience and he's going to be the stunt coordinator yeah so again when we had those the the, the crowd seeds of deadly eyes when people are running anything that that's not acting and i made <laughs> sure that i was always in a situation where i couldn't get trampled in because I, I couldn't trust the skills of the of this newbie uh stunt coordinator he had no one supervising me he he was he was the head guy oh yeah Besides, well, the, besides the innate fear that was fueling you, can I ask about what kind of shoes you had to run in during during at least like 1984? Because some of those shoes, like I remember at least one scene where you're in the hallway and you're trying to get Perry King to follow you um, and kind of taunting him. And those shoes looked like super tall, kind of. At least yeah, like so, so, so remember like the first two weeks of school, how you had your new shoes on and you always got these really big blisters and you'd be limping around? That's how it was for me of class in 1984 because I actually asked for those boots. I used to see those kind of boots in a kind of an S and M part of Toronto, and they went and got them for me, but they weren't broken in. And so my feet, and of course, they're you know low budget. There were no other second pair of shoes for me to put on between takes or anything. And my I was constantly just like leaning on one foot with my. <laughs> you know, on the side of my foot. And that's in the poster that I'm standing like that. And that's not acting. It is it, 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 because my, I, I had such big blisters on my heels. And then there's that one scene where we're walking down the, 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 the gang down the hallway and I'm in high heels. 
I'm shorter than them and I'm trying to keep up with them in high heels. And it's like that Ginger Rogers thing in Fred Astaire's that she did everything that they did backwards in heels. And that's me in that gang trying to keep up with them all the time, not having, and, and I, I, I never had anything to do in the fight scene. So I'd, I'd like jump up and down and, clap or I said to Mark, I'm going to grab this Polaroid and take a picture. And I, I'm always was trying to find business to do because I was never part of the rape. I was, you know, or me saying, I like to watch. That was because that year at the Toronto Film Festival, being there was, was featured. And there, that was part of the logo of the Toronto Film Festival that year. It was, I like to watch. So I just threw that in. I was con there was nothing. Patsy was just in name only in that script. So everything you see me do, like whether it's this or this or this, or I'm taking, <laughs> it's all made up. I made it all up because I, I was given nothing to do. So it felt like very sexist that, wait, I'm a member of this gang, but I'm never given anything to do or to say. Just barge right in. And, and like also like in, in the alleyway, I went up to Mark and I said, I have nothing to do. So I just want to pick up a bo bottle from the, uh, from the alleyway because there's going to be bottles in a real alleyway and I want to hit it and put it up to her neck. And thank God Mark didn't have an ego where everything had to be his idea because he said yes to everything I asked. Or I said, oh, I'm going to do this now, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Because otherwise I would have just been a special business extra. That's a one. That's a so funny. Also, they, they weren't bringing me in to play Patsy. They brought me in to play the Aaron Noble part. And I said, oh, come on, please. I mean, I, I said, I, I get those parts all the time. I don't even have to open up my mouth. You know, yeah. that's the way I look. And they go, well, we just, you'd be so good. We just don't see you in this other part. And I said, look, let me come back. I said, I grew up with four older brothers. I, I know how to be tough. I've been around their friends. Let Just let me, please. And I came back and I got the part. But yeah, I would have been, I would have gotten the Aaron Noble part. Yeah, and I mean, I could see, I, I mean, I could see you playing that, but you're much better as Patsy. That's right. You know, I like Deneen quite a lot. She's very charming, and Aaron Noble's awesome. But you know, like you really just kind of decided, like to like making Patsy a character that adds like a whole new dimension to the movie, at least right. for me. And, and and at the same time, that movie broke my heart. It really broke my heart because. Um, there were so many things that were just wrong where people weren't protected. Like they treated the extras so badly. Like they, they worked all those long hours and there was for food, there was like a, a table with a big vat of peanut butter and, and a big vat of jam and some wonder bread. And you know, that girl didn't want to take off her clothes. And, and, and she, she, I remember watching the makeup artist putting makeup on. She said, nobody's going to recognize me you the after I get finished with you and when she was taking off her clothes she was her body was literally like trembling and and Tim Van Patten said to me I just can't stand this and I said neither could I so it was truly acting on my part to just really be into her put my arm around her and I like to watch because I just I just really empathize and it broke my heart because you know they we all we all all the Canadian actors we did them a favor by not they didn't have to pay our buyout for television right away so they could just get the movie made well we never got paid for television, for VHS, for DVD, nothing, nothing, nothing. We never, never got paid. And I'm sure, and you know, that's part of the, you feel like you're a colony in Canada again, where you're just like the cotton pickers, that you should just be happy you have this job. And it's, it breaks your heart to see that you're being exploited, like as, as like these laborers, as like, it's almost like you're a, you know, a, a wetback. And then you, they turn around and they don't get paid. and. I, I see people wearing t-shirts with Patsy on it. And this guy just recently, you know, sent me this thing on Twitter of these, he's going to be selling these pins with that picture of Patsy going Elizabeth Taylor. And, and I don't get a dime. Don't get a dime. Yeah. And it, it, it kills you as an artist. It just, it just kills you. Cause I, you know, I'd rather the money go to charity recently and, and, and went for people to lie to you saying, well, we didn't know. Oh wait, there's, there's rogue people getting copies. <laughs> The producer is like, what? They're taking rogue copies of everything, you know, and 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 putting them on DVD and VHS, like Shout House, and all those people are doing that. It so breaks your heart. Just breaks your heart. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things about 1984 that are uncomfortable, but yeah, 
uh, when that gal does have to strip down, it was like, ooh, yeah, kind of, you know, very much like not feeling okay with this. And then later on, of course, there is the gang rape scene. I was like, this is really not what I was expecting out of this movie. <laughs> like as far as horror goes, it was very much like, wow, this is actually too close to real life. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, you know, and when we got really dressed up and everything, I mean, you know, that outfit that Patsy had on, which no, I'm sorry, I didn't keep it. Um, <laughs> but like, I don't remember ever seeing, you know, gang people, but that that's also part of the, I guess the fantasy, fantasy of the whole thing. But it, it's really interesting how iconic it is. And, you know, 1984 too, that, you know, that, that, you know, it's an Orwell novel about, about the future. Mm -hmm. and I still wonder what people think of it now, like young people, if they watch it, but my son is so funny. I mean, he's 20 now, but I remember maybe 10 years ago, he showed me this picture that was on his phone of Patsy. And he said, mom, this is what I show other parents. And I tell them this is my mother. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, you fun. should know. You should know that uh, the last drive-in with Joe Bob Briggs just showed Class of '84 in the recent season, so it is definitely still in the zeitgeist. Yeah, it's, uh, it's and, and, and um, you know, I just I, I love that it looks grainy. Um, I one of the other big disappointments I had too is I is um, Carol Pope, and I don't know what happened with the negotiation, but she. It was she was supposed to have the opening song with High School Confidential, and she's a punker. So it for me it was more right that she, but I don't know what went wrong with the negotiation. And so then Alice Cooper, not that his song isn't great, but you know she is a punker and she's an iconic punker, Carol Pope. And I love and High School Confidential was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the Alice Cooper yeah, song. Alice Cooper got paid. Well, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. But the, that was that period, those three albums that Alice put out that were new wave albums. And I think that he was probably pushing as hard to be in cinema and get that image to work. It ultimately didn't work for him. Um, so which is why a couple of years later he goes heavy metal and had a second career. But it probably was one of those things where, as you know what, behind closed doors, there was a lot of conversation about, can you help me if I'll help you? Interesting. Yeah, good point. But you know, um, and also this, this whole thing is that... Um, you know, there's low self-esteem in this country. It's gotten a lot better. Like I, I came back four years ago after being in the States for 32 years. And my, my brother goes, Please, you're not Canadian. You're, you're, you're American. And I said, yeah, you know what? I'm glad. I feel like that I gleaned the best parts of both cultures and the people. But I think that maybe because it was an American director producer that getting, you know, Alice Cooper, who's an American icon, would have been more prestigious than getting Carol Pope, who's a Canadian. I agree. I agree. That's probably what happened. Um, and, and from the Alice Cooper side, it was, we got to rebuild the, the empire and cause the school's out slash billion dollar babies days were way behind them. That wasn't mm -hmm. current. He put out, he was putting out new wave records. It all, it all kind of made sense, but I agree with you. I mean, 1984, that soundtrack should have had the circle jerks and, uh, you know, yeah. it should have the punk rockers of the time on it, but they had teenage a head. They had teenage uh, head. And the, you know they were Cana Canadian, so they had them. But uh, yeah. and speaking of punk, like you know Stephen Armgrim, like you know I, I he, he came from New York, and I, I thought he was the real thing. <laughs> you know, I, I thought he was a real drug addict for real because he was so thin and and pale skinned, and he was so good in the part. And he, he yeah, I just I, you know, I was kind of afraid of him, you know. And then and then like flash forward thirty years, just a couple years ago, he contacted me because he. Had, he he wanted. He said, "Hey, do you want to do these conferences together?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll do that." But I and he's just so nice too. I thought, you know. And then Tim Van Patten, he was just so unhappy on that film. He so didn't want to be an actor anymore. He said, "I don't, I don't think I want to be an actor anymore." And he was, at the time was just more. He was doing a decathlon, and he was just more interested in being an athlete. And then lo, and then I remember he got the call to audition for Grease Two with Michelle Pfeiffer. And you know that that was big time for me, right? And he said, I, I, I just want to go in on it. I just don't want to do that. And how great for him that he went on to be this great director. I mean, he just I, didn't want to be doing it. But he, I thought he was so good as Stedman. He is definitely. Yeah. He's the anchor that is is somewhat relatable in a movie full of unrelatable things and people. 
Yeah, and he said, I don't want to wear these costumes. I just want to have regular clothes. And I just thought it was a really great call. And then, to, you know, I, it came as a shock to me that when he just sat down and played that piano, that that was epic. That's awesome. That I was going to ask that, too. I was like, that that was beautiful. And honestly, for a second, I thought Class of 1984 was going to take a weird, like, Dangerous Minds or Stand and Deliver turn. And then, no, it doesn't. It just keeps no. spiraling. No. Spiraling down, and by the way, you're, you're totally. Yeah, and ironically, dead. years later, I, I marry this guy, and he ends up being the ADR supervisor on Dangerous Minds. Oh my <laughs> god! There you go. I have all those stories. Yeah. I want to make sure we get uh, the questions from the uh, from the chat in here because we're 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 infamous about letting them go by. So, Delhi Ghost at, wants to hear about your experiences with the man who wasn't there. Such an odd one. You know, it's so interesting that you said that. Because I, I, this is so ironic. Another film that completely broke my heart because of the lies. So it, it was so interesting because right before this started, I just thought, you know, I never, I never say to people, you can't ask me these que uh, questions. Because, you know, there are actors who say, you can't ask me this, this, or this, and that. And I thought, you know, if there was a film, something I didn't want somebody to ask me about would be the man who wasn't there. <laughs> And, and <laughs> so well. you know, I've, I've, I've come from working with Hal Ashby, and, no, not Hal Ashby, but John Huston and Claude Chabot. So, and I'm, it's my first film in America, okay? And I'm screen testing against Jennifer Jason Lee, and I'm being told this is like a big break for me. It's Steve Gutenberg is going to play his first romantic lead, and I'm screen testing for it, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, this, this just isn't funny. This film <laughs> isn't funny. We, we, this is not funny. And they think it's hysterical. Well, it turns out it's the 80s. And like what I discover when I start on the film is everyone's on cocaine. And in fact, at one point, the DP in the middle of Washington, D.C., you know, he's scratching all over the place. He's on the, on, 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 in the middle of the street on the ground, like pulling this tantrum. I, I just like started crying. And the producer, I went to my trailer, asked me why I was crying. And I said, the fact that you don't know why I'm crying makes me cry. <laughs> but, <laughs> So what kept me sane is Jeffrey Tambor, because we, we, we just like, it, this was insanity, it was so bad. But the biggest heartbreak was that they lied to me. So they said that this is this top secret movie that nobody could get on the set. They weren't even allowing entertainment tonight. And you know, I, I had a boyfriend that actually came down with me from Canada and he was a director of photography. I'd met him on, he was the camera operator on, on Happy Birthday to Me. And they told me there wasn't going to be nudity, that I would only be seen in silhouette, right? But, you know, the set was bright. It was normal. And I, I actually went up to the, the DP and I said, listen, why is it so bright if I'm just going to be seen in silhouette? And he said, oh, it's because it's this new, <laughs> new technology of 3D and that's why the set has to be bright. And being having started out in Europe where people just take off their clothes, but nobody takes advantage of it. It's nobody's salacious or anything. I, I did what I was told and I did everything. And um, I remember I came home and I said to my boyfriend, I said, I asked him the question. I said, you know, the DP said that it has to be bright. The, the set is, you know, normal. I can see everything, but he says it has to for this new technology. And he said, Lisa, the way it looks on the set is the way it's gonna look on the screen. And I was so humiliated and horrified when I saw that film. Then all the all the letters come in from the lifers in jail. And then you go back to your high school reunion, the guys say to you, you know, I saw you nude in that movie. And it's never over. It's never over. And you know, I even I, Frank Mancuso Jr., I came up to him and I said, This is a PG movie, right? And he said, Yeah. And they they just and then the worst, when I look back, that in the middle of the night when you know you can't get a hold of the Screen Actors Guild and everything else, and they're not allowing anybody in the sex, it's top secret, your manager. There I am, nude, opposite a tiger, a lion, and there's there's no no screen between us. So again, no acting. When I ran up that, I, I scaled that wall to get away, because I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I, 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 you know, they, they wouldn't make me do anything that I could hurt myself. You know, can you say, you know, um, you know, uh, John Landis, can you say John Landis when the helicopter hit all those people? There I am with a lion nude. And so when they they rolled and I'm 
with the lion and the, the, the cast and crew are on the other side of the partition, my heart was thumping like midnight express time. And I couldn't scale that wall fast enough. And to this day, that film is the biggest regret. And I'll never forget, I hired this big PR agent and my boyfriend who was working on a film on um, in IMAX on, on, uh, in the Grand Canyon. And I, I had to choose between doing this three, being on that, doing the adventure and, and being on the Colorado River for three weeks, no contact, this is before cell phones, or doing PR on this film. And I remember my <laughs> PR person said, Lisa, best thing you could be, do, because he saw the film, is be on <laughs> unavailable and on that trip for three weeks, unavailable at the bottom of the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. And it never goes away. It never goes away. And it, it's almost, when I see Steve Gutenberg, I, I feel that we're like, uh, we've been, at, you know, we're, we're survivors of a war. And the guy that invented that, that 3D system told me the story that he was at the screening of Police Academy with Steve Gutenberg's managers. And he, they had just seen the man who wasn't there and Police Academy, which they, he said he, they saw them, him turn to Steve and say, your career is over. And then Police Academy ended up being this huge hit. Who knew? But they thought seeing Police Academy back to back with the man who wasn't there. But yeah. And then Art Hindle, of course, too, he said he, he was at this restaurant once in Los Angeles and Jeffrey Tambor was at this other table and he stood up in front of all these people and said, see that guy over there? He kept me sane during that movie. And <laughs> Jeffrey want, just wanted to get out of the television. He wanted to be, he wanted to be in movies. And at one point they're gonna cut out because of time, that big long speech he did. He said, you don't understand. I only did this movie because of that speech. And ironically, he became the big star. But yeah, we, we spent a lot of time, Jeffrey and, and, and me on the, um, going to museums in Washington. It kept me sane, but yeah, everybody was on cocaine, the whole crew, every, it was the eighties and they thought everything was funny. I was going to make that joke and I thought it would be cliche. <laughs> but you beat me to it and it's true. They were just hoping that the whole audience was going to be on cocaine and be in on the joke, but. Uh, I, 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 I just cannot believe it. And, and then also I couldn't stand the way they did my makeup and my hair, like the big hair and the big makeup and everything else. And, but the, the makeup artist was off of like Donnie's to your dad. She goes, I, I did Victoria Principal's makeup. And I just thought that's exactly who I don't want to look like. So what, once what happened, I'll, I'll never forget this. When, when I started like running around and going, getting in the water and, you know, being all disheveled, I remember the producer and the director said, Lisa, we've been watching. We discovered that you're looking better as you get more <laughs> hair and, and you have no makeup. I said, exactly. The hair and makeup is the wrecking crew for me. Yeah. It just, it just, yeah. It was just so, it was, it, it broke my heart. It just, and that was my first, it was supposed to be, you know, like I screen tested against Jennifer Jason Lee, you know, Christy Brinkley was up for the part. So this was supposed to be a, a coveted role I got. I wasn't, you know, had I had a strong agent and manager to, to taking care of me too, that never would have happened. Never would have happened. They, they, they would have read everything and said, there's no way Lisa's doing that. But I was just too young. And I believed them when they said, well, nobody can be on the set because it's top secret. We're battling against Universal's Jaws 3D. And I believed them. They just wanted me to do what they needed me to do. And with nobody saying, Lisa's not going to do that. Yeah. <sighs> Griffin asks, what are your top three favorite films that you grew up with that inspired you to become an actress? Um, that's a really good question, looking back and when you say grow up. Um, I didn't really see films as what inspired me to be an actress. I just, I think it was playing, you know, dolls and cowboys and Indians and liking that feeling and then at school, being in plays and that, it wasn't really the movies. It was liking that feeling of make-believe. And ironically, I when I I ended up being with this acting coach in uh, Los Angeles, and that was the basis of what he talked about, is that if you could just get back to your innocence, 
that children make the best actors. And, you know, when they play cowboys and Indians, they really believe what they're doing. And when they're killed, they really believe it. And if you can just get back to that innocence, that's great acting. Yeah. Innocence doesn't cut in Hollywood. I mean, like hearing, <laughs> Not, hearing all of the bullshit that you've had to put up with. Listen, listen it ruined my vulnerability and it took me a lot. And then, then, then of course you have like the whole Weinstein happening that wherever you go, it's just never over where people are propositioning you, um, you know, come up to my hotel room. Like it's just, it's just never over. And I, and I, like I just bought Sharon Stone's book to to hear about it because I remember like you know I, I I hung out with her and then there was like this diversion thing where I went off to India for a month and she said bring me something back and she said I'm I'm in this movie and it's either going to make or break my career basic instinct and then like there's this huge she goes off to be this mega star and and you know I have what's going on in my life and you, then you get reunited and I, I'm anxious to hear what she has to say because I used to always think God like. I was sharing, you know, she, I, maybe I need a little bit more of the Sharon Stone in me for, for what I'm facing and can't wait to hear what she has to say about, you know, facing these dragons. I mean, really, the, the Weinstein thing is, has been a gift because everybody's saying, no, it, it doesn't have to be that way because it, it was endless. It was endless, the people propositioning you. And then when the other person gets the part, you go, did they do it? Did, did, did they sleep with them or were they just pro propositioning me? And what if I had slept with them and I still didn't get the part? And like, you know, like before Sharon Stone in, in Basic Instinct, like, you know, being on the t ABC Talent Development Program and you're know, going for the follow up and the vice president of ABC casting says, you know what your problem is, Lisa? You need to go to auditions and wear a dress. You don't wear any underwear, sit with your legs open. So when Basic Instinct came up, I, it's like, oh, okay. And it's, it's just endless. It's just endless. So you know that that's, if it's happening to me, it's happening to everybody else, but nobody's talking about it. You yeah. Know, and it's still happening even in like, okay, so like I, I'm a big pro wrestling fan still happens in professional wrestling today, really? today, very recently. Oh, I had no idea. I had like, I watched what I really liked about watching um, Hollywood you know, because I, you know, you go, oh, am I going to watch this? this? You know, how many things about Hollywood? We see, but this was the whole other side of the casting couch for 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 with males, because you know, I hear other actors tell me that mostly in theater that they've been propositioned by directors and 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 that. So it, it it was so great to see this film about Hollywood, where this there's this whole other side where the curtains pull back about you know males being propositioned. Yeah, and you know, I know it happens to men and women, but you know, I really, really appreciate hearing like, hearing all of this from you now, because I really hope that, you know, there are some women out there if they're pursuing, you know, creative fields, women and men that, you know, it's like they have the, you know, they could hear these stories and they can have the same giant set of brass balls you have right now. Calling I, don't know, I don't know what, what, what I do, but what, what, what complicated things more. And I, in the past, I would never talk about this, but this is about, helping people but you know i'm i'm a survivor i i was molested as a child so you know when people say what happened to careers well you know when somebody does that to you it totally takes away you like i escaped into my head which is how you survive as a child right but that doesn't work as an actor so you lose your vulnerability so it took me until i got to kate mcgregor stewart and she brought back my vulnerability my innocence my ability to play because I got into my head in, in a way to protect myself, which didn't work as an actor. But, you know, I would go into th these auditions and, you know, those people are sitting in the front, the people that have propositioned you at network. You're, you're, and so I'd go in there and I'd forget my lines or I'd self destruct. I, I had this casting director take me outside and say, Look, what, what happened to you in there? I know you're at, I know your work, you're really good. And I didn't know. And then and at n another time in my, I started stuttering. And I didn't know that it was all, until I went to a, a a career coach, she said, yeah, you're walking into this room, it's all men. And instead of being the ingenue anymore, you're having to be sexual and that's what's happening. And so for somebody to reveal that to me, then I could get better and then I could work on it. I just didn't know it was wrong. I didn't know why yeah. I was doing that. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I, I was with this guy and a boyfriend who was vice president of Mercury Records and vice president of A&M Records. And he told me about all the abuse of women 
in, in, in the music industry, that it was for a long time just accepted that if you're going to open for someone, a big star, a woman, that they just come by your hotel room at night and they knock on your door and you're expected to sleep with them. Oh. It was just an accepted thing. And, you know, do I mention who those people are? That he, he told me them. I just thought, oh my God, that breaks my heart. I don't want to believe that about them. Yeah. And you're just, you're just, to just, and if you just don't do it, you just don't get to open for those, those artists. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would imagine fame and power just changes people completely, but it's like, it's not worth it. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not. And I used to think that it was like, you know, in the turning point in that fight between Shirley McLean and Anne Bancroft, where she said, you just didn't pursue your career because you, and you went out and had a child because you, you, you just weren't good enough. You knew you weren't good enough. So I put off having a child because that was going on. It's like, do I really want a child? Or is it just my way of saying, you know what? It's just not working out for you. You, have, you haven't had the career that you set out to do. Because my, I wanted to be Jodie Foster. I wanted to be Jodie Foster. You know, I went to university and she spoke French and I did. She read Claude Dubois and I did. And I just, I just loved the kind of career she had and the kind of movies that she did. And then it didn't unwrite. It didn't turn out that way. And so. I said to myself, or are you, do you really want to have a child or is it just, are you giving up? And I'm so glad I did now. I'm so glad I did because, you know, when I'm on my deathbed, I'm not going to be crying out for that great movie that I did. Exactly. 100%. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do have to say though, uh, you know, it's first off, just as a side quickly, cause I got to get this out. Rose McGowan is one of my big heroes and a lot of people give her shit for about some of her personal failings. You know what? We all have personal failings. Yeah, we do. But she, but she and I, and this and it's funny because you use the same analogy that I always do. But she st absolutely slayed a motherfucking dragon. He that makes her a motherfucker. And I'm and 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 there are there they're just more and more out there. And like just even the like you and you protect these people too because you think that they're gonna like Rose destroy your career, right? And with Harvey, it's like all these great actresses. When you think, well, what did happen to them? Now we know what happened, but. You know, I still I'm protecting this great acting teacher because like Ray Liotta and, and Melanie Griffith, like all these like James Warren, they were all in the class again. And meanwhile, he's sexually harassing me. When I finally leave the class, he starts calling somebody who knew me, uh, my girlfriend, saying, "Where's Lisa? What happened to her?" And, like to this day, and I'm just finally trying to get. I'm finally going to write him. I'm finally going to write him to say, "Man, you destroyed me for ten years. I had no vulnerability." And like I kept thinking, I'm, "If I'm a good enough actress, I can overcome this." But you know, you get up in, in class, and he's right there, sitting and watching you, like you know, right there. Yeah. And uh, and then huge PR guy, like you know, hey, trying to put his tongue down my throat. And then he goes, and "You pull away," and, you, and he goes, "Really?" Because I'd really get off kickstarting your career again. And you know, he can do it. Mm. You know. Cause he, he represented like Michael Jackson, ironically like Bill Cosby, but huge PR, huge PR person. And they can do it. And it's just like, I have to like myself in the morning. I just have to like myself in the morning. I just, and remember my mother saying, you know, Lisa, I think a lot of these actresses who got had drug and alcohol problems, that they just don't like themselves in the morning because what they had to do. And that would ring in my head, you know? Yeah. But you know, Lisa, the, 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 the real truth here, and it might not be a thing that's easy to believe, but it's absolutely true. Your body of work in, inside the genre and beyond, but is going to endure in a way that the mainstream people who got the breaks, who took the shortcuts, won't have that ability. And it's 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 your strength that you made the right decisions at the right times, even if they seem like the wrong projects at the time. Yeah. Thank thank you. I and what's interesting is I I pivoted away from acting. My my son was in a catastrophic accident in the States, catastrophic, had 20 surgeries over 10 years, you know, wheelchairs, walkers, crutches, the whole nine yards. And, you know, oftentimes I turned into Shirley MacLaine and turns into Dearvin at the, it's time for his, it's time for his pain medication. And, 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 and so there, and then there's no work for you. And so you end up doing all these side hustle jobs again. And, and then I got this great opportunity. I ended up moving back to Canada because Moses Neimer, this visionary, you know, guy who's like the Ted Turner Canada offers to me to produce a, a TED talk in his Idea City, and I loved it. And then I went on to produce another one. I thought, well, I don't really miss acting because it doesn't matter what I look like for this. And, you know, it's very stimulating. And then COVID took it away. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, well, I have this skill here. And I'm back in Canada. Just get an agent. And I got a top agent. And I'm this woman 
knows me from the heyday and I'm, I'm active, more active than I've been since the eighties. And I feel that I'm getting my second chance here. And I think I'm going to, I'm stronger as an actor than I've ever been because early in my career, I was only as strong as my director. And that's why I went to acting classes because I'd fall on my face when I did the, when I, when I would do a film like the man who wasn't there or, and, uh, but now I'm totally self-reliant and I, I, nobody's going to take advantage of me. And what's great is there's roles for people. I never thought there'd be roles for people my age. And I'm now going out my third time for this Ron Howard, Brian Grazer thing. And, What's different now is I don't care like I did that. I'm not reliant upon it. I'm not. You don't. Know, right. like, I look at those old. Films, I look at those old films, even though they're they're laughable on the artistic level. They're you know they're not they're not you know. I'm good in them. You are. And and, and like what I say to people is when they, people say you know like when you when, when you only get when there's only the budget to do two takes. The second one only in case there's a hair in the gate. If you remember. Mm -hmm. you got to be good to turn it. Cause I remember an acting coach saying, saying, saying to me, Lisa, you know, Meryl Streep and them, they get, they get a lot of takes. So if you're not good. And you know, when I work with my ex-husband, like he, he was at top level doing, you know, relooping all these actors, like every single line incentive of a woman for, for Pacino and, and fixing the accents and the lists and all these like big actors, huge. And I'm thinking, no wonder they, they're so good. They get like, so many takes like how oh. Ashby's assistant telling me that you know on 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 coming home that what's his name that played the male lead Angelina Jolie's oh damn it I can't think of it how many syllables sounds like oh, I don't even know how many so like that last scene where he does it he breaks down she said like they must have done like about 40 takes until he finally broke down and I, I remember when I did my, for, like I did the slugger's wife at one point we did eight takes and I thought I was doing something wrong, but it wasn't about me. It was about other things. They just want to get it perfect. And what a, what a, what a luxury to know. Keep going. Crap. Yeah. Well, if you have money to do it, because time is money on, yeah. on the set. Definitely. You know, it's, it's funny because phobia is my favorite of your work. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not going to make it. It's favorite what? It's my favorite of your work. Phobia is. Um, Thank you so much for saying there, that. There, there, there is this incredible sequence in the film, in which uh, it's after the second death in the film, and the group the of patients come together, and they're discussing how they feel about what's going on. They're also a little bit paranoid because now it's not an isolated event; it's starting to be something else. And the funny thing is, it's it's these group of actors that are all kind of going at it from a different a very different acting regimen, but you are so wonderfully still in the sequence and you, and your character, if you do, if people haven't seen phobia, which you absolutely should see phobia, <laughs> um, phobia, Lisa plays a, um, a survivor of sexual assault who is, has uh, PTSD about the event. That's what we'd call it now at the time. That yeah, you said, that it was right? a phobia. But, but, but there was no description of, nobody said that word PTSD, but you're absolutely no. right. It was PTSD. Yep. And she's um, going through this experimental uh, procedure to make, to have her overcome it, which involves uh, audio visual presentations. But the thing is everyone else went big at moments and you appropriately let your echoes be stronger than your actual performance. The stillness of that scene is so much more powerful. It's, it's, you see someone who's been hurt and all the theatrics in the world and all the hand waving in the world wouldn't have done it. And it's just your instincts at that moment to be quiet and make every line matter is just, it's so powerful. And you're that, that is a film in which everyone's good, by the way, it's everyone just, good, yeah. you, it, that scene is the most powerful scene in the film, which is a little now, bit of now, now I got to watch it, but it's so funny you said that because getting back to the man who wasn't there, that's how I do act because I I, I have to trust that whatever, I, if I'm truly experiencing it, then the human barometer of the audience will experience it, okay? And and the the, 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 the one acting coach that did sexually harass me for all this year, he used to say one thing that, he was so right on it. it. It relates to what you're saying. He said, and it was about trusting that you don't have to do, you can just be. And he said, 
when there's a dead body in the room, that body isn't moving or doing anything. And that body, everyone's feeling that body in the room. And that body isn't doing anything. It's dead and not moving. Meaning that you got to trust your the human barometer. And um, But getting back to the humanity wasn't there, there was that this scene, and I'll never forget it, where I was really experiencing the situation. And the director was off, you know, looking at the camera that's this big, right, the replay. He came up to me, and, and you know, I was actually crying for real in it. And he said, Lisa, you weren't doing anything in that scene. And Art Hindle stood up for me. And I said to him, it was the first time I talked back. I said, you know what? You may not be seeing anything because you're watching it on a small screen. But when you're watching a theater this big, you will see because I experienced a situation. And I just also trusted John Houston. Right. I trusted him. So actually, let's let's go to there because I know. That, Perfect that, timing. Griffin asks, how was working with John Houston? He wasn't a creep, was he? <laughs> now, you, now you do do tell a story in the, on here about the infamous bathtub scene, which is not, um, I think the scene plays a lot more dramatic than um, exploitative anyway. Right. So I don't think, I don't think he was um, going for the exploitation. No, he wasn't. The, the exploitation was, is that, <clears throat> and now, since that time, there's actually a rule with actor in Canada, I don't know what it was to say, but was the presumption that, you know, my agent just got a call one day. It wasn't a script. Oh, by the way, there's going to be a bathtub seat and there's going to be a flash of breasts with Lisa. Like the, the cavalierness, <laughs> but, you know, by the way. And I hadn't done any nudity yet. And I was really, you know, I kind of really wanted to do the Michelle Pfeiffer thing, who we've never seen nude on scene. And yet she's, a, you know, known as this, the most sexy, beautiful person. And, and and it's not so much about the nudity that bothers me. It's that when you have a child and then grandchildren, you don't want that to be all over the, you know, everybody to be seeing that. So anyway, what happened is I, I, I was really, t I just didn't know what to do. And so I went up to John and every, you can see everybody's intimidated by John. It's John Houston and <laughs> the voice of God. You got the face of God. And I, I finally got the courage to go up to him and I said, you know, Catherine Hepburn would never do nudity. He said, for me, she would. <laughs> and so, so then I thought, okay, well, why don't I do it? And then I can't believe I did this now, getting final cut from John Houston. Uh, I'm going to watch it, and if I don't like it, it oh, because no, no, they said they're going to get a body double. That was it. So this body double shows up, and she doesn't look anything <laughs> like my body, including this huge birthmark right here. So as an artiste, I just thought, well, I might as well do it myself because they're going to know it's a body double, which is just, you know, coming from Europe, working with European actors, you just don't do that. So I thought, I'm going to do it because I that's clearly not professional to have somebody that looks like that doing my body, big birthmark here. And then I'm just going to see if I like it. And, he, and what I didn't like was this one, they told me it was going to be this overhead shot, which I thought with me floating would be very interesting. But unfortunately, it kind of wasn't overhead. It was more this way, shooting upwards. If you get what I mean. Oh. So that that so the and the big disappointment, of course, is when I go to the, what's back then when nothing was digital. The rushes, it wasn't closed, and so you have like every driver is there to see the scene. Like everybody's in the room, <laughs> and that was really hard too. That there there was I felt no respect for me. So then I said I didn't like it. And then there was this, this big brouhaha about it. And I remember the same boyfriend who said about the man who wasn't there, the way it looks on the set, the way it's on the screen. He said, Lisa, push back on this because they don't want that kind of PR that, you know, John Houston took advantage of, you know, showing nudity with his actors. And um, to this day, I never really thought it was him. I always really thought it was the producer who wanted the nudity. And... Um, Again, it takes ultimate focus in your acting to just forget about that and just do the scene. Um, At least it makes sense. Once again, that's what, like, you know, if, if you get asked one more time, how do you do nudity? <laughs> just, if you just get asked, well, can you stop asking that? And it's just part of your craft. That's not what's hard. What's hard is people always asking you about it. How do you do a lovemaking scene? It's not hard because you're just thinking about where the character is. What's hard is people always asking you about it. 
Well, we'll we'll let it go in just a second. I just want to say, at least it made context. And it's made sense in context because your character was because of her history and because of it being about her being vulnerable. You know, it's kind of the end of Sigourney Weaver at the end of Alien needs to be in her underwear to put her in the most vulnerable place she can be. Um, I think I think it works. By the, the way, I auditioned for 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 Alien. And well, well damn it! Now, the, now the, I want to see that the film. The agent at the time said, you know, he likes really tall women. So I wore my cowboy boots with a little heel. <laughs> Didn't stand a chance. I, I, well, I love Sigourney Weaver, but I want to see that film. I want to see the version that you star in, too. I just, like, Lord, that was, like, a legitimate, that was a cry of legitimate anger. I don't think I've seen you that mad in a while. Like, where's my yeah. cut? <laughs> Because really, I just want to see Lisa be able to make the sequels and her pushback on Jim Cameron on the second film to make a film that's coherent. But anyway. Wow. Uh, Way to make it about you, man. <laughs> that's okay. At some point, it always comes down to my complaints about aliens. Um, so, we, God, if, you know, we've been going for an hour and we haven't covered more than like three of your movies. But I, so what I'm going to I say, let's give Christian the last question uh, about Class of 84. And we um, haven't talked about happy birthday to me or deadly eyes. I know it's that crazy. Is, and like, is it a horror film class of 1984? Is it, or is it just a thriller? I don't so, know. It's so close. It, it's a, it's, it, it's a horror, but it's a thriller too. Right. Well, I think my definition of horror is uh, a genre of the dramatic arts that is, seeks to elicit a response from within an array of emotions including stress, uh, horror, disgust, gallows humor, et cetera. So any dark emotion, really. And I think that is where Class of 84 lives. It's kind of, um, it's more than that, though. It is, it's a social statement on top of that. There is that Orwellian, uh, although kind of cast through a kind of veneer of, of that time period, what was in the pop culture at the time, so the, the punk rock imagery, the kind of, the fear of the future with the the uh, metal detectors on the doors and, and violence in schools, period, which was being experienced in Philadelphia and in Detroit and in Miami at the time. So I think I'm going to say it is a horror film. It might just not be what people jump to think when they define horror. Right. Oh, I, I've just thought of something, getting back to movies that I really liked when I, in my youth. I love Hush Hush, Sweet Charlotte, Straight Jacket, you know, the, the, those kind of movies. Love them. In fact, on Class of 1984, I suggested it to Mark that at the end that the, the the mask is pulled off and it's someone else. That's very much, that reminds me of Happy Birthday to me a little bit. Oh, that's now. what I was going to go to. Yeah. I mean, really, like, I just saw that movie for the first time and I was like, what is happening? There are so many twists and turns and it kind of reminded me a lot of uh, A Simple Favor with Blake, um, Blake Lively and Anna Kendrick. Which I thought I was. I never, I never saw that, but you know, I, I, I saw a couple of years ago with a reunion of, of Happy Birthday to Me, and that is the one film though that is not, it's not, it's too, it's too slow now. Unfortunately, it needs to be recut for this generation. It's, it's, it feels slow. It's oh hard yeah, hard the, the bridge jumping after. It, it feels Absolutely. like. It feels legitimately like the time period it's set in, though. That's that's the right. Thing. Good point. Good point. So it's like for me, I like to seep in movies. I like really to just feel movies. I, slow is always good for me. I'm like the guy who wishes Hereditary was two hours longer. <laughs> so, um, great casting again. The casting was great. And did you notice that, that uh, David Eisner was also in Phobia and Happy mm -hmm. Birthday to Me? And he's such a great actor. He was so good. Mm -hmm. Both of those films. And in both films, he's given his his moment to that that transparently was like everyone realized he had to have his moment, because yeah, especially in those uh, they're not full soliloquies or anything, but they're they're long kind of introspective. Yes. Moments. Yeah. He's an artistic director now of a theater here in Toronto. Is he? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's awesome. It's you know that's another thing like about these. Not just the tax shelter years in Canada, but really with the independent New York scene of the late seventies, with the Deep South productions, um, you know, in Georgia in the late sixties. There's all these people that came up in those scenes, and you don't get to find out like what happened to most of the people. Oh, you know, Lenore Zan is a member of Parliament in Canada. <sighs> That's unthinkable. Love it. <laughs> and she has pink hair. 
Oh, member of parliament. Yeah. You know, in Canada, half the parliament are women. Isn't that amazing? That's... Great. Well, she says she loves it because she gets treated like she's intelligent. <laughs> Well, that's the, she was playing all these like sexy parts and was asked to take off her clothes all the time. You know, I just got asked again to take off my clothes or something. And this time that I learned, they go, I, I they, they, they called me and they said, well, does she have a problem with the swimming? And I said, well, I don't really have a problem with the swimming. I have a problem with the, the nudity. Is there going to be any nudity? Well, no, no, you're not going to really be nude, but you will have to be nude getting into the water. And I said, you know what? I've, I've learned my experience. Once you get me nude and the camera's on, you do what you want with it. So I'm not. I, I can't, I can't, I can't believe you. Good. It's just Fuck never him. over. It's just never over. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just like, I'm just like, I'm problem, just not problem, problem. Yeah. Do you have a problem with the swimming? No, no, I don't have a problem with the swimming. Do you have a problem with the nudity? Can you just clarify? No, no, you're not going to be nude. You have to be nude getting into the water. Oh, is the camera going to be running? Oh, the stills person. Are they going to take pictures? Put it on the internet? Yeah. You know, just you know, like meet him halfway. Do do a swimsuit, but it'll be like one of those real, the old timey swimsuits that are like bloomers and full sleeves. And it's like, there you go, you got your swimming shot. Uh, you know, I, speaking of horror, The Nest, the Corman movie, another film that broke my heart. I, I I had I didn't know Corman was, but again, there was a shower scene, and my agent negotiated no nudity. She's got to wear a body stocking. Lo and behold, the day of the shoot. Um, there's no body stocking. So I thought I'd do the uh, Phoebe Cates thing. I heard her that they're always trying to get her to take her clothes off. So she put gaffer's tape on her nipples. So not wanting to be the difficult actress and say, I don't want to do this scene unless I have a, you know, a body stocking. I, I thought I'll do Phoebe Cates and I'll put some gaffer's tape on my breasts. So we're shooting it. And every time they'd say cut, the DP would turn to the director and he'd say, we got to redo it. We keep seeing the tape. And he turned back to me and said, Lisa, we're seeing too much. We're seeing the tape. Can you just take off the tape? And I said, no, no. If you're seeing the tape, then you're seeing too much. So I'm not taking off the tape. So Julie Corman comes, takes me off the set, brings me into my the trailer. And she says, I heard that you're very difficult to work with, that you have an issue with doing nudity. I said, I don't have an issue with doing nudity. I've done nudity for John Houston. I said, but in my contract, I'm not supposed to have nudity. And I'm supposed to have a body stocking. And you don't have one. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have, I hate having to take that person out. And they're lying to me. Would you just take the tape off? We're seeing the tape. Did that hurt taking the tape off though? Because I'm thinking about like, ooh. You know, I can't remember. What hurt more is them. They they make it look like you're the difficult person. You're yeah, that's the difficult that's actress to work with. Yeah, and you know, yeah. You know, I say fuck them. I'm sorry. These people are pissing me off now. <laughs> I know it's not. I know it's. I know it's work was was smarter than me because I trusted them, and what he did is he had this like little, um, kind of triangle thing that he had toupee tape. Oh know. yeah, Merkin. It, well, it wasn't the Merkin though. But no. he, yeah, I got a funny story about that. Um, <laughs> had that underwear thing, and he wore that, and uh, I, I just thought, oh, why aren't you trusting? And he was just smarter than me. Man, these people are pissing me off, though. I'm just like, mm. I'm holding oh, a grudge on behalf of yeah, you now. My, <laughs> friend Brent, my friend Brent Huff did this movie with Tony Katane called The Adventures of Gwendolyn. Mm -hmm. He wore a Merkin. He goes, Lisa, I just wish I had more Merkin because it was even worse because they showed it and I have no penis. <laughs> <laughs> so watch The Adventures of Gwendolyn, right? Well, you should anyway because that movie oh, takes no. an incredibly strange turn in this last quarter. Does it? Uh, Oh, yeah, you think it's like an Indiana Jones film, and at the end, it's all sci-fi and weird. I have not and seen she, it. I guess I'm going to put that on the and, list. And there's a very weird chariot scene. But uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I to go with weird, it. We have a weird chariot. Okay. Yeah, we did. I'm not going to so, ask. Television was kind of the, the second side of your career as well. Um, had, had things like uh, Nightmare Classics, where you did Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, and uh, Forever Night. How did how did you go into television, and was there different expectations? Or so I, I it was the days before John Travolta and Michael Fox, Michael J. Fox, that he became crossed the line. Right, there used to be two separate things. So I it hurt my career once everybody wanted TVQ because I didn't. I said no to TV. And, and, 
and then even on the ABC Talent Development Program, I got offered <laughs> to do General Hospital, and I chose the man who wasn't there over General Hospital because I wanted. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I chose the man who wasn't there over General Hospital because I didn't want to do TV. I didn't want to be a soap actress. And um, what's her name from Flamingo Road? What was her name? Uh, huh. I, I, anyway, screen tested for General Hospital, and they they. I remember when walk, seeing all these women with hot rollers and their robes walking around with the big makeup, and I just thought I can't, I can't, I can't do this. And I was looking down, and they did my hair, my makeup, and, they, and I looked up, and I didn't recognize myself. It's like, is that Brooke Shields or who? You know, who is that? You know, so. Um, and I did this screen test with this guy who was a stunt coordinator, nice guy, but really bad actor. And I just thought, I just, I just, I can't, I have to lie too much to make this work. So I, I chose the man who wasn't there. And um, still, actually, I guess it was the best, it was the, the right move. And um, the Nightmare Classics thing, I did that because of the director. I had an agent at the time and she said, he's a really great actor. And I went in for the, um, what's her name? Oh my God, her father is also an actor. What's her name? Um, great actress. I went in for that part. She got it. She's more the name. And so they gave me that other part. But it was Michael Lindsay Hogg was the, was the director. And at the time, I remember listening to um, Donald Sutherland say um, that he has no control over the, over the success of his films. Laura Dern got the part, yeah. And, oh. which, you know, I'm, I'm so unlike Laura Dern. Right. And then anyway, she I went in for it, she went in for it, she got it. So I, they offered me the other part. But I remember him saying, I gauge my career not by the success of my films because I have no control over them, but who I get to work with. So that's where I was at then. Oh, Michael Lindsay Hogue. And you know, he, very talented man. It was it was great. And then and then same with Forever Night, you know, Tim Bond, that was a great part to play somebody who was modern. Uh, then a backtrack to uh, somebody who was in the 1800s who was a nun and then speaking French. And Tim Bond wrote the script for uh, Happy Birthday to Me. Really? That's yeah. Wild. Yeah. I, I loved Forever Night. I didn't watch it as much as my mom did, but I remember, I distinctly remember long sessions of Forever Night growing up. You did? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was, I, oh my you God. Know, since the beginning of my career, when I used to go out for commercials, I had the biggest crush on when I was doing commercials. I, that's how I started because I needed a way to pay my way to university. His name was Gary Davies, but by the time he got to Forever Night, he he went back to his real name, which was Gary Davies, and he never asked me out, but I always had a crush on him. So the one time you wanted someone to, to you know, waddle up to you and with a, with a flower, it didn't happen. No, nobody ever did that. The actors never did that. Other than on the only person who waddled up to me and I really fell in love with him and it took me a couple of years to get over him was my leading man in um, Blood Relatives, Laura Mellet. I just, I was just like head over heels for him. Hmm. So Jay the Stingray says, I love the nest. That's David. the one we're talking about. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I, you know, I, I was young and they were going to have a, a Directors Guild of Canada, I mean, a Directors Guild strike, and they said it was going, going to go on forever. And I thought, oh, I better work. And I thought it was going to be like the birds. <laughs> <laughs> I, Not quite. <laughs> so I met the director, and, you know, I, I, that was my, and, you know, I didn't know what Corman was, and I wasn't afraid of low budget. I'd been on low budget films with, like happy birthday to me, right? So I wasn't afraid, but I didn't, I should have done my research. And I had, that was the same agent who sent me in on the Michael Lindsay Hogue as, as this Corman film. So I thought she must know what she's doing. I was just too naive and too, you know, took people's advice. Didn't stay with Lisa. Yeah. But that said, you look at uh, a lot of people that are doing the horror convention circuit that have one or two titles that that are enough to just have a career ha getting autographs at conventions for two titles. You have a list. Somehow, 
whether you whether it seems like a good or bad move, you have made so many cult classics that have such endearing fans. And it's better to be in a cult classic. Well, and I love those fans. That's what I've learned. And I didn't even want to do those autograph shows. And I've only done one. And that's when I fell in love with them. I just thought, now I get it. These are wonderful, sweet people. I just love them. And they pay money. Yeah. Um, but no, you you have this incredible resume behind you and you really are horror royalty. So I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. Oh, I'll come again. This is great. I love well, you. I was, I, was I was just going to say that because we didn't even cover a we third of the titles so that, I, that I had on the list. And there's so much more than that that I cut because I figured we wouldn't have time. So if you want to come back. I'd I'm love to come back because, you know, it, I love appearing when somebody has intelligent questions and they're not just the same question because that's when it's acting it's the same questions over and over again and you and you have to act because you, you have to make it sound like it's the first time you're answering it like, this was not like that at all really well researched really well phrased i just completely both of you enjoyable and then the sense of humor right Oh, I'm sorry. I'm an asshole. So we can have, have a laugh. But tell me something. Will my son be able to see this? It says it's live. Yeah. Is it yeah. recorded? Yeah. It, so it'll be archived by YouTube almost immediately. Um, on a good day, it's immediate. On a bad day, it's a day later. But it's been very quickly recently. Um, for the comments to come back, that'll take a little bit longer. But the video itself should be up almost instantaneously. Um, I'll, I'll th definitely throw the link at you so that you have that that you can share. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of actually, you know, because I, I just don't care anymore, right? And I'm older and the Harvey thing happened that maybe I should have one recording somewhere, something where I out everybody. Oh. Well, oh, if you want to do that. The oh, out episode. For it. No. The out ep yeah, because I started doing it a little bit like I couldn't believe what I said on phobia, but I just thought, you know what? Why am I protecting these people? Exactly. Yeah. Fuck them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. don't, but no, fuck <laughs> their careers. I just had to talk to uh, an attorney to make sure that I can't, like, I can't get sued. It's the truth. As oh, yeah, we don't want to get as, sued either. We don't have money. As long as it's, as it's true. true. Listen to this. I have a friend that, I, by chance, I met Gloria Allred last year. I was at this red carpet event. Really? And I was standing in line at the bathroom, and there she was next to me. And I just I just want to tell you how much I... I want to thank you for what you've done for women. And she said, here's my card. Flash forward a year. I know somebody who like totally, totally abused by her brother, who was like this huge person in the music industry. And I said, I just happen to have this card. So she's gone forward and Gloria Allred asked for a lie detector test. I love that. I'll take the lie detector test. Woohoo. Give it to as, me. As long as it's true, and as long as you didn't sign a non-disclosure uh, agreement at any point about the material, you are in the clear. Yeah. Uh, so uh, cool. we'll talk. Okay. But even if we don't do that, we definitely have to get you back I here know, for the rest of the career. Now because there are movies to talk about. I, we didn't get so, to. So, so Lisa, when I warned you that it was a quick hour. <laughs> I, know, I know. it's it, And it's quick because I'm enjoying myself. Because I'm telling you, at first, like I was... You know, they can't reschedule because it's live, but I had the worst 24 hours between my mother going into the ER, my son falling and hurting himself, and I had this audition this morning. It was just like, and I was exhausted, and my makeup, like a half an hour, and I said, Lisa, come on, you got to be the professional. You've had the same makeup on since 10 a.m., and it's like really shiny on you because it's really humid here. Be, somebody's got to be the adult here. Go and do it. And after I washed my face, put the makeup on, and then got here 10 minutes ahead of time, it was okay. But at first I was exhausted. I had a nap, which I never did. I know, Lauren told me that and I was like, I love her already. I'm a big fan of midday naps. I didn't get one today, but. Yeah, I should, I should I basically never be, I should just be, basically never be conscious. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be better off. But yeah, yeah it, it took real discipline. Cause it's like, oh man, I'm exhausted. and. Oh, and then the hockey game is on. And, yeah. I know you like. Uh, I know if I felt bad because it's like, oh shit, she's got a hockey game on. And now well, I, it's, it's like I've embraced hockey again since moving back because I'm telling you that the spirit here is incredible. Yeah. So I taped it, and I am not going to listen to anything. 
saying whether they won or not, and I taped it. Because again, I have to be the professional, right? Well, the chat's not gonna not gonna spoil anything, so you're good. Well, I'm not gonna look at the chat. I'm gonna this, just awesome. when this is off, I'm turning on the TV, and that's it. Yeah, and then I'm yeah. Dog -sitting for my friend because her. That's the other thing. Her, I'm dogsy because her, her brother died. She went out west, and during our interview, the dog started snoring. <laughs> so that's, I hope they can't hear it. We have a stray that we're taking care of right now, and I can hear him barking outside, and I'm worried that it's like picking up on the microphone. <laughs> you, now, usually on the show, guys, it's cats. Are you both in the same town? Are you guys in the same town? I'm oh, in no. Texas. It is humid AF here. You're in Texas? Yeah, it's super hot. And, it's like and hot humidity. How is your temperature? Uh, oh. It was in the 90s today. Lauren, what are you hitting at? Lauren, what are you hitting at? Uh, in Jersey right now, it's 87 degrees. It was up to 92 today. So That's not too oh, bad. 92. And it, today it got cold in Toronto and rainy, so that was good. But the last few days, it, but British Columbia, it's like California. They're having all these fire. It got up to one place like 140 degrees. I've heard, uh, yeah, I can't believe what's going on on, on the, uh, you know, on some of the West Coast as well, like Oregon and California. But it's like, whoo. Yeah. Oh, no, Oregon and Washington. Am I correct, Lauren? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah, because they're having like record high temperatures. They're th these are like horror movies in themselves. <laughs> yeah, it's, no. more, it's worse than the Blob. Yeah, I'm like, I'll take that. I'll take another winter storm issue if 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 I can get a, get a, get out of like exactly because with the winter storm temperature. you can go inside and you can also like put things on yourself and everything. But there's no escaping it, and it also just I just feel like the world's gonna with a winter storm. It's not like the, I feel the world's going to burn up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I would prefer not to have a winter storm only because I know our power grid can't handle it. Clearly. <laughs> clearly. I know. I know. Oh my God. Leave my power grid alone. But last year it was even worse when, when all those koala bears were dying from, in Australia. That, that was so hard. Yeah. And it just, it went on for months. Yeah. The, and then of course, COVID came around and we no longer heard about it, but it was still happening. Oh, we never got any news. Yes, it, no. there, there, suddenly there were no wars in the world. Oh, or, no, no then, nothing then, else was going on at well, all. COVID opens up and then there's bombings it, it, between the Palestinians. And the, right. the first first off. Yeah. Right off the it's mark. it's, it's yeah. almost like the media is not telling us what's going on all the time. I don't it's know. It's almost like we're being lied to. I, I, I don't know. COVID and Trump. It was all part of the horror year. It was like a, you know, it, it just the, the the two of them together, COVID and Trump. I'm just so happy with Biden, and you know, he just he st he, he tells us what's going on. He's on TV, and he empathizes, and yeah. Yeah, uh, all I can say is, uh, I voted for the for, for the third party candidate who didn't get any electoral votes. So oh well, there's <laughs> three parties, so I love it because. The third party has no chance of winning, so they can bring up all those contentious stuff. But I don't know whether you heard. that's that's what we need to happen here is that the, oh, there needs to be at least a me, so me, there needs to be a they media presence, even win. if it's not power. Yeah, they know they're never going to win, so they can bring up all the stuff. But what happens is the other two parties they want to get their favor because they can win by aligning with them. But right. I don't know whether you it's in the news down there, but you know Canada, who's always had this like squeaky clean reputation, it's it's being uncovered that they, they have these things called um, residential schools where they put all the indigenous kids to yeah. they're run by the Catholic church to take away their religion, their, 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 their language. So that was bad enough. That they did that. It was bad enough. They took them away from their parents. But now in the last couple of weeks, they're just discovering all these mass graves yeah. of dead children. That's horrible. It's over for Canada, the squeaky clean reputation. And, but the, the Pope isn't apologizing. And then the church is saying, well, we don't want to hang, hand over the documents because, you know, Canada is saying you have to because we have to identify these children for their families. And meanwhile, the indigenous people have been saying these, that they've heard these stories for years, but nobody wanted to believe them. It's, it's horrendous. We just yeah. had Canada Day, which is like the July 4th of Canada. And it's been a national day of mourning. They said, we're not celebrating it. It's just, I almost wore my orange ribbon to on this show today. Just anyway, it's just, it's, um, it's just so horrific. It's a Holocaust. Where, where, wherever yeah. there, wherever there are people, the worst will always be able to make uh, life pretty horrible. That sounds like the opening to a horror movie. 
It is, well, it is. I mean, ultimately, <laughs> wherever ultimately, there are people, <laughs> horror is really about what we do with our world. You're um, right. And, you know, speaking of horror, I've just moved on to true crime. Like, I'm a junkie for friends oh. and files, and I'm listening to all the pot. My bedtime stories are all the podcasts on true crime. That's like my modern day horror for me. Yeah. And in some cases, it's actually worse because these things happened. And yeah. it's now you don't have that the, the barrier of fantasy preventing you from really thinking about it. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 I'd argue that the barrier is at a certain point became irrelevant because we, we always used uh, horrific imagery in fiction and in film to kind of contextualize the real stuff. Well, at a certain point, there was so much of the real stuff that fiction couldn't get the job done. So we've turned to our interest to the real stuff, although there's still a small buffer there, right? Because we put it in the framework of a television show or a podcast that's somewhat familiar in its format. We can put a little bit of distance there, but we keep inching closer to the real thing. It's it's kind of fascinating because people don't look at violence on in film the way they did 20 years ago. I know. And I think in general, that's a good thing um, because I don't think anything fictional needs to be frightening to be. Well, I know, but like, like taxi drivers tame now. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So yeah. scary. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Lisa, we should let you go. You'll come back. That's going to be exciting. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, 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 we also need to talk about the conventions. Like, who, like, do you know any agents or like, I got to get on to it. It's, mm -hmm. my, it's time, right? Well, hang on after the end credits and we'll get you there. Oh, we Everyone, still on? I thought that we, we were in social. No, we're okay. We're, well, that's cool too. Uh, everyone out there, thank you for watching. Everyone that uh, participated in the chat. Oh, COVID hair. This is my only video <laughs> over here, just so you know. It looks gorgeous. But Monday, I'm getting it done. Yeah. I've had a wow. haircut. I had to go. Your hair is I, fabulous. I, I did it. And it was, I had my hair cut in the black market. It's like it's like easier to go into an alley and score drugs than it is to get your hair cut in Canada. But um, I'm, it, things open up today, actually, and I'm getting my hair cut on Monday. I mean, colored on Monday because I'm not a natural blonde anymore. Oh, I'm not a natural anything, but your hair looks fabulous. You showed up and it looked, it was immaculate. <laughs> like mine's just like hanging out here. Well, I have a good oh, hair. You're way behind us. Uh, well, I I'm can't sorry, play I that. I the one bald joke in per show. Well, exactly. Yeah, I realize, I realize. Anyway, thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. We are back um, eventually next week. Oh, the ball joke! Oh, did he just tell her that all fine furniture have a mar has a marble top? Oh, that's good. That's right. a good one. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to remember that. Next week is a light week on the channel. Of course, I will be at the Imaginarium Con in Louisville, Kentucky, from the 9th to the 11th. So, if you want to come say hello, I'll be on some panels there. Other than that, on the 23rd, Evie Knight uh, will be joining us to talk about her literary career, and more will be announced shortly. At any rate, have a good one, guys. Be safe. Be safe. No Roman candle fights, okay? Thank you. I'm getting pissed.